Welcome to this Day One Conversation. I'm Peter Wallace, and with us today is the Reverend Dr. Sharon E. Watkins. Sharon is President and General Minister of the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, headquartered in Indianapolis, Indiana. Sharon, thanks for talking with us. It's great to be here. For those who may not be familiar with the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, how do you describe your denomination? What are its distinctives? Well, we are um, what is known as one of the mainline denominations, and we uh, are a Christian unity movement. We've resisted through the years being um, a denomination at all because we're so um, clear that people are called um, as individuals into um, service for uh, God's reign on earth. So we're very um, focused on both um, the, the, the value and gifts of each individual. And um, as we share those together, it also means that we um, come together as a whole community um, that um, in, in mutual respect and love finds a very deep unity. And the history of the disciples goes back to the early 19th century on the American frontier. What happened to get the church started? Well, on the American frontier, people started to realize that they had brought with them a lot of the divisions and controversies from Europe that just didn't Mm. make any sense here. And so people uh, found that they wanted just to have a very simple faith. They believed in God. They believed that walking with God made their lives better and that um, they didn't need to be fighting with people over um, some... A controversy that took place back in Scotland and back there they couldn't commune together. Well, it didn't matter here. So um, they just wanted to come together to worship together and serve God together. And you have had a rich ministry in the church and in the academy. But in 2005, you were elected as general minister and president of the denomination, a position to which you were recently reelected. What brought you to this place in your ministry? Well, it it was a surprise to me to come to this place. Um, Sometimes you imagine that a person might be sort of on a career track. Mm -hmm. Um, But for me, um, coming straight out of the local congregation, it was a little bit of a surprise to be sort of catapulted into this arena. But in fact, um, what was important was that I was straight out of the local congregation, What disciples were looking for at that time was someone who could uh, symbolize and make real for us our traditional belief that uh, mission hits hits the ground running at the local congregation. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's been a really important part of my ministry has been to um, be a word of of um, hope and encouragement that um, where we live in our everyday lives really makes a difference. Like most mainline denominations, the disciples have conservative members and liberal members and everything in between. But what draws you together and how do you do that? Well, there are two things that are really critical for us. One is our understanding that um, it's our Uh, faith in Jesus Christ, who shows us a God of love um, that is important. And so we don't have a lot of doctrine. People come into our communities and what they um, uh, receive and what they expect to offer is a sense that in the love of God, there is room for each and every one of us. And uh, so what we say is we don't come together based on a common opinion or even a common um, desire on how to worship, Uh, but we come together out of a common love for God and an experience of God's love for us. And that goes deeper than all of the other things that can divide us. And so if we keep finding our way back to that common ground of God's love as we know it in Jesus Christ, that's going to bring us together. The other thing then that is really important for us is the open table. Uh, communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist um, is, is, is central for all of Christian uh, faith and expression and practice. Uh, for disciples, um, that table is an open table, and we see that as a foretaste of the reign of God. Among the priorities for the disciples are new church establishment, congregational transformation, leadership development, and anti-racism. 
Why those priorities and, and how are they being addressed? You named the four exactly correctly, and three are similar and one is different. Um, the, the new church congregational transformation and leadership development all have to do with um, being better able to um, 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 share the gospel through congregational life um, and, and developing communities of faith that are missionally focused and contextually relevant. Um, we've worked really hard and feel really good about where we're moving in each of those areas. I think um, when we first set a goal that in by the year 2020, we would have a thousand new disciples congregations. And uh, that seemed like a pretty steep goal, but we have been uh, ahead in numbers all along. And so now the number is up to um, nearly 700 new congregations and just over half of the time that we'd allotted. So we feel Mm. like something very exciting Mm -hmm. is happening there. The anti-racism priority is one that's different because it's not a um, a kind of a, a measurable... Um, qu- uh, not a quantifiably mm-hmm. measurable mm-hmm. thing. So whereas you can count how many new congregations you are on your way toward a thousand, um, the uh, anti-racism uh, initiative goes across all of the other three. Each new congregation should be a pro-reconciling anti-racist mm-hmm. congregation. Each transforming congregation should be a pro-reconciling anti-racist congregation. And It's an important priority for us because uh, we started out as a Christian unity movement on the American frontier. At that time, our concern was denominationalism. It was divisions brought over from Europe. What we understand in the 21st century is that those ecclesial differences don't matter as much. Some of those battles have been won, but we still see the human family managing to divide against itself. So divisions of culture and language and race drive us apart as Mm. human family. And so for disciples, what we understand is that as a very ecumenical body, as a body that has always believed that it is enough to love God and Jesus Christ, that that is all it takes to bring us together, then we know we have to have a very strong witness as Americans when it comes to racism. Racism in America has been called America's original sin. Mm. And we as disciples, a Christian unity movement, have to self-consciously and intentionally work to root out the vestiges of racism in ourselves and in our church if we're going to claim to be um, um, a Christian unity movement. Mm -hmm. And you believe that following Jesus and engaging in social justice in a more broad sense are inseparable. And as we think of the legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. this weekend, I have to ask you, is the church modeling that goal well enough today? Well, we I, I would say not well enough. Mm-hmm. We work at it. We have said that our vision is to be a church of true community and deep Christian spirituality and a passion for justice. And we think that justice is not an add-on. Um, if you love Jesus, you do justice. Um, it's, it's about trying to um, um, uh, live already on this earth as though God's mm rain is already breaking in here. And um, and it's it's challenging. It's challenging because um, we are so diverse, and so not everybody agrees specifically on what justice looks like. Mm-hmm. It can start to um, look like we're having political debates. Uh, but what we try to do is to remember that uh, Jesus talked about freeing captives um, and uh, feeding the poor, um, of, of making life better for all of God's children. And so when we think about doing justice, that's what we're thinking about, is walking in the ways that Jesus walked. And, um, and as a church, we continue to try to challenge ourselves to get better at it. The landscape for mission is certainly changing in the 21st century, particularly recognizing the reality that the center of Christianity is shifting to Asia and Africa. Mm -hmm. What does this mean for the North American church? 
Well, it means several things. One is uh, for the North American church, we have tended to think of the mission field as over there somewhere. Mm -hmm. What we now understand is that the mission field is all around us. Uh, People who are our own um, neighbors down the street don't know the, the, the contours of the Christian faith. And so we have an opportunity to witness right here. We don't have to go um, far to the far lands. Mm-hmm. Um, in the same way, it means that we have a lot to learn. If Christianity is growing like crazy on other continents, um, places where we have always felt that we had something to take, what we now understand is that we have something to receive. And so um, it is really uh, providing a, a United States and European Christians with the opportunity to um, develop a certain kind of humility toward our brothers and sisters and to be as much in a receiving and learning posture as in a proclaiming and offering posture. Sharon, organized religion has been taking a hit in our culture, it seems, with many people preferring the description of spiritual but not religious. What do you make of that phenomenon and are they missing something? I think they're both on to something and missing something. Mm. Um, again, as a disciple coming out of this tradition where uh, we uh, came into being wanting to uh, um, be released from divisions of the past and dogma and doctrine that related to particular social situations of another age and another place. Um, I think disciples have a natural uh, tendency to understand people who would want to throw off Mm. um, too much church regulation now. So um, to be spiritual but not religious, I think, Um, to me has a little bit of echo of my own um, ecclesial history. On the other hand, God made human beings to be in community. Mm -hmm. And um, so if being spiritual but not religious means that people want to have their whole faith experience as an individualized faith experience, then I think they really are missing something. I think coming together in communities of faith where there can be um, mutual accountability um, and uh, uh, where people can um share with each other what is happening in their lives, in their in their spiritual growth, provides opportunities for growth and for knowing God that um, simply aren't possible um, by oneself alone. So so I, I have a lot of sympathy for spiritual but not religious, but I also think that um, there is a strong role and a continuing role for communities of faith. What denominations like mine with a long history have to figure out is um, how do we provide those communities uh, in ways that really meet the spiritual needs um, and and provide appropriate spiritual challenge for people today. What we've done in the past may not be the right thing for now. Doesn't mean it was wrong then, but um, but we the, the the Christian faith needs to be eminently adaptable mm-hmm. to the times in which we live, and so I think spiritual but not religious are actually telling us something. Let's talk just a little bit more about that. Many denominations are struggling to transform themselves for the twenty first century. What do you see happening in the future for the church? Well, I think right now we're in a place where we're finally figuring out what the context is actually like. I mean, for a while, I think we were struggling even to admit that we were in a different time, a different landscape, a different Mm -hmm. era. Now I think we realize that um, we can look around us and actually note that um, people don't necessarily know the Christian faith anymore, that we're in a time of incredible diversity, and that whatever happens, we're going to have to be able to communicate well across uh, many generations, across uh, many languages and cultures. So one of the things that about where we are right now is we've finally been here long enough to be able to look around, identify what the context actually is, and begin to figure out, okay, What have we brought 
that is still useful? What have we brought that we might as well put down because it's not Mm going to serve us any longer? And what do we have to invent that's Mm -hmm. new that meets the needs right now? So I think we're in that period of trying to sort things out. And what's going to happen next, I think, is that we're going to be able to start moving forward, um, having done all this work that we're engaged in here. I look um, forward to it. I think it's an incredibly exciting time to be church. And um, I think a, a lot of us who have felt like we were in in separate communities, mm-hmm. um, separate denominations perhaps, are going to be finding that we are closer and closer than we ever knew before. And um, that as we move forward, we're going to see that there is some realignment Uh, along different lines than before, but that as we discover each other and get a sense of what the common core is, that that's going to release a tremendous amount of new energy. And um, I hope I get to experience some of that, get Mm -hmm. to be around long enough to experience some of that. Sharon Watkins, thank you for being with us. It's a pleasure to be here.